There's nothing quite like the sound of a V8 engine. Some people hear a hum. Some people hear a roar. Many hear music. According to Science Focus, there's a reason why the V8 sounds so appealing to people's ears. Cylinders are like wind instruments. During each piston cycle, air is sucked in and then forced out. Each cycle makes a tone. Obviously, this happens with all engines. But the V8 has an irregular firing sequence that gives it a distinctive, pleasing sound. Then there is the speed and power. Humans are obsessed with going fast. The moment one record is broken, people are lining up to try and better it. It's not just psychological either. Driving fast gives us a surge of adrenaline, which causes our blood pressure and heart rate to jump. So there are a lot of reasons why people love the V8 engine. It also evokes nostalgia, particularly in America. The V8 is America's motor. It was adopted in the U.S. more than other parts of the world. It was suited to America's wide open spaces. American manufacturers built some of the first and most influential V8 engines. V8 engines are mostly only being used to power cars that are too expensive for ordinary people. It seems that the V8 story has come full circle. What do we mean by this? Well, in the beginning, the V8 was an engine in cars only the rich could afford. Then Henry Ford made V8 engines accessible to the general public. We'll talk more about this later, but now it's only the rich who can afford V8s. But why did this happen? Well, there's a lot to do with the way a V8 engine works. Like the name says, a V8 engine is an eight cylinder piston engine where the cylinders are arranged in a V configuration. Like any engine, air is pulled in when the piston moves downwards and compressed when it moves up. Then the spark plug fires, igniting the mixture which forces the piston down. As the piston comes up, it pushes out the exhaust gas. All of the cylinders are connected to a common crankshaft, which converts the up-down motion of the piston into rotary motion. In the V8 engine, each cylinder fires at different times. This makes power delivery very smooth. It's a big advantage of a V8 engine. Another advantage is more combustion is created. This means you get more power, but there are disadvantages as well. More combustion means more gasoline. It also means more emissions. There are also more moving parts, which means more friction and more wasted energy. So V8 engines are smoother and powerful, but less efficient. There are ways to improve power efficiency in a motor. That's how car makers have been able to make four and six cylinder motors that deliver the same performance as a V8. There's also aerodynamics. The more aerodynamic the design, the less resistance, the more efficient. But efficiency can be influenced by other things too. One of these important things is how you drive. Top Gear did this in the test of the Prius four-cylinder hybrid in a number 92 chassis BMW V8. They drove the Prius as fast as they could around the track and the MR just had to keep up. Turned out that the BMW V8 used less fuel than the hybrid, which goes to show how the way a car is driven will affect fuel economy. The question, of course, is whether the people who drive the V8s will be driving in a fuel-efficient manner. The answer is probably no. The V8 is about speed and power. It's the reason it was created in the first place. The first known working V8 engine wasn't actually made for a car. It was designed to power an aircraft. Its name was Antoinette. A 39-year-old French engineer named Leon Levavasseur took out a patent for the engine in 1902. The engine was named after the daughter of Levavasseur's financer, Jules Gastembin. It was manufactured in 1904. Its first appearance in a car was in the 1914 Cadillac L-Head engine. Cadillac was led by Henry Leland. Leland is a name you may not have heard, but we must mention it when talking about V8 engines. He founded not one, but two of America's famous luxury car brands, Cadillac and Lincoln. Those brands are both around today, over a hundred years later. They're brands that use V8 engines way back then and still today. Cadillac was originally the Henry Ford company. Henry Leland worked for Henry Ford. When Henry Ford had an argument with his investors, he left the company in 1902. He took many of his key partners with him. Then the following year, he started a new company, the Ford Motor Company. Back at the old company, Henry Leland managed to convince investors not to liquidate. Instead, they changed the name of the company to Cadillac. That's why the first 1903 Cadillac is so similar to the original 1903 Ford A model. They were both essentially Henry Ford's designs. It's also why Henry Ford had a lifelong grudge against Henry Leland. No. 
Leland Bell Cadillac into a successful luxury car company. He sold the company to William Durant's General Motors in 1909, but stayed on as an executive. It was during this time that the 1914 V8 Cadillac was produced. Then, during World War I, Leland got a contract to produce V12 motors for the Army. This led to a dispute with William Durant, who was a pacifist. So Leland left the company and started the Lincoln Motor Company. Unfortunately, the government didn't pay for his work and the company went insolvent in the economic downturn of the early 1920s. It was Henry Ford's opportunity for revenge. He purchased Lincoln and had Leland and his son escorted out of the building in 1922. So Ford was building V8s in 1922 for the Lincoln line. He was also looking at an X8 engine. This turned out to be too heavy and complicated and repeatedly failed. He was trying to figure out a way to bring more horsepower to his cars for less money. The X8 engines were just too expensive for ordinary cars, so it was only the rich who could afford to drive cars with V8 engines. This all changed in the early 1930s. By then, the Ford Motor Company was in trouble. Chevrolet had introduced a six-cylinder in 1929. They were also doing a good job marketing and promoting the six-cylinder model at the same price you'd pay for a four-cylinder. So, by 1931, they were outselling Ford. Henry Ford thought it was over for four-cylinder cars. He closed 25 of his 36 plants and laid off 75,000 men. He had a secret operation in Greenfield Village working on an eight-cylinder engine that would be affordable for ordinary cars. Finally, he was successful. The V8 flathead was cast as a single block mold engine. Up until then, V8 engines were made with multiple parts. The single engine reduced the pieces required and the cost in 1932 Ford when they released the first affordable car with a V8 engine. Cars were able to reach speeds of up to 75 miles per hour. But it wasn't just ordinary people who could go faster. The car was also favored among American gangsters. In 1934, Ford received a letter supposedly from Clyde Barrow endorsing the Ford V8. That's Clyde Barrow of Bonnie and Clyde. The V8 took off literally and figuratively after World War II, especially in America. The wider American cars were suited to bigger engines. Muscle cars became synonymous with American culture. But even as far back as the 1940s, there was a hint of the challenges that lay ahead for V8s. The French introduced a tax on horsepower after World War I. That was before many European companies had even brought out their first V8 engine. BMW only made their first V8 in 1965 and then didn't bring out another one until 1992. Then the oil crisis of the 1970s led to tight emission standards in the U.S. In turn, this led to less passenger cars manufactured with V8s. Improvements had led to better performances in the four to six cylinder engines. V8s were phased out for more efficient designs. The good news was that the four and six cylinder engines that displaced the V8s in many vehicles generally combined good performance and fuel economy. Let's look at how car makers get more power out of a four or six cylinder engine. First, there's variable valve timing. In an internal combustion engine, air enters the cylinder chamber and exhaust gases exit the cylinder chamber. The opening and closing of the intake and exhaust are controlled by valves. Variable valve timing allows these values to open and close at different rates that are dependent on the speed they're driving. Variable valve controls when they open, how much they open, and for how long they open. Today's cars have sensors monitoring things like airflow and camshaft position. These sensors send information to the variable valve timing, telling it how to behave. Next, fuel injection. Traditionally, the carburetor controlled the mixture of fuel and air that was sent to the cylinders. The problem with this is that it couldn't supply the same amount to all four cylinders as some were further away. Fuel injection improves this process by delivering the fuel in precise bursts, which makes it more economical. Finally, we'll mention turbochargers. A turbocharger forces more air into the cylinders each second. That means they burn fuel more quickly, releasing more power. This has enabled four-cylinder engines to meet the power needs of average Americans. You only have to look at this chart to see what it means for a V8 and even the V6 engine. Since 1999, the four-cylinders have grown more and more popular. Fewer and fewer cars are manufactured with V8 engines. And those with V8 engines are very expensive. 
so only the wealthy can buy them. Even in that space, though, V8s aren't safe from competition. Electric vehicles are quickly coming up to speed. The BMW's all-electric i4 is a top speed of 120, while Tesla's updated Roadster is a top speed of 200 miles an hour. At the same time, fuel efficiency requirements are increasing. So even at the top end of the market, V8's days may very well be numbered. What is a rotary engine? How does it work? Is it better than a conventional piston engine? And what does its future hold? First of all, where can we see this type of engine? Many of you might say Mazda, and you'd be right, like the Mazda RX-7 and RX-8. Three generations of the Mazda RX-7 and the singular generation RX-8 that followed share this type of engine. These cars had a rotary engine with a volume of just 1.3 liter, which produced 232 horsepower. That's a lot of output for such a small volume. Well, let's look at some of its features. A rotary engine is a type of internal combustion engine in which the main moving working part, the rotor, rotates. The rotor is essentially a piston with a combustion chamber and it rotates. No additional mechanisms are required to obtain rotary motion, whereas conventional combustion engines with pistons need a complex crank mechanism to convert the reciprocating motion of the piston into the rotational movement of the crankshaft. That's the main difference between a rotary versus a conventional engine with reciprocating pistons. The rotary engine is often called a Wankel engine or Wankel rotary engine. That is because it was originally conceived and developed by the German engineer and inventor Felix Wankel. Wankel received his first patent for the engine in 1929. After World War II, Wankel worked at NSU Motorwerken, a German company that produced motorcycles. He worked under Walter Frude. Wankel did extensive research into rotary valve seals. Although Wankel had a patent, the basic design and engineering concept belonged to Freud. The first engine had a rotating chamber and a stationary rotor. There were some limitations to that design. So this led the team to change the circuit. The first rotor engine began operating in 1958. After NSU Motor Workings announced it had created a new and promising engine, many big name car companies started licensing design to produce rotary engines. We saw the results led with the Chevrolet AeroVet XP895, Chevrolet Vega, Mercedes C111, Citroen M35, and luxurious Citroen in GS Barotor GZ. Believe it or not, a third of the licenses ended up in Japan. The toughest Japanese company to make rotary engines turned out to be Mazda. So how does a rotary engine work? Unlike a traditional piston engine, a rotary engine doesn't have a gas distribution system or crank mechanism. Their functions are taken over by the eccentric shaft, and the rotors act essentially like pistons, and stationary gears set the path of the rotation of the rotor. The base of the motor consists of an intermediate casing, which is located in the middle of the motor and stator, which form the working chambers. The rotors themselves are located in the stators. The entire engine structure is covered by the front and rear housing, in which the station Stationary gears are fixed. It's along these that the rotors rotate. The whole engine is pulled together by long bolts. Overall, it's a rather simple design, not complex. The design is based on a triangular rotor which has convex edges or faces. The rotor rotates in a planetary manner around a stationary gear that acts as a stator. When the apex of the rotor triangle rotates, it moves in a pattern like a complex curve within the shape of the working chamber, inside which the air fuel mixture is ignited. Also, in the walls of the rotor are recesses that form the volume of the combustion chamber. The absence of a gas distribution system helps simplify the design, and a high power density is achievable, even with a small and light engine, because it lacks the crankshaft, connecting rod, and other interfaces between the chambers. So the rotary has less moving parts than a reciprocating engine. In fact, it's about 35 to 40 percent less parts. If we were to compare the dimensions of a rotary versus a piston engine with the same power, the latter would be twice as large. So a car with a rotary engine is easier to accelerate, and it's smooth. Plus, the rotary engine doesn't suffer a lot of stress at high RPM, even if the car is accelerating to speeds over 60 mile an hour in low gear. A car with a rotary engine is also easier to balance and has better handling. Even the lightest
this car doesn't suffer much vibration because the rotary engine vibrates significantly less than a reciprocating engine. The rotary motor has the same four-stroke cycle as its competitor, the piston engine. One working cycle of the engine consists of four strokes and one revolution of the rotor, or three revolutions of the eccentric shaft. The first stroke is the intake phase, the second is compression, the third is combustion, and the fourth is exhaust. In the intake phase, the rotor's motion causes a drop in pressure, which draws in an air-fuel mixture. The mixture gets drawn around the rotor and is forced into the second stroke of the cycle. As the rotor continues to turn, the captured or cross-hashed volume contained between the rotor and housing decreases, compressing the air-fuel mixture. This is the compression phase. When the active mixture volume is a minimum, one or more spark plugs initiate combustion. We are now in the combustion phase, where we see rapid rises in pressure and temperature. The sudden expansion of the now gaseous fuel mixture transmits a force to the eccentric through the rotor. As the rotation proceeds, the expanding gases drive the rotor until the exhaust port is exposed, releasing them. The exhaust process continues as the intake port opens to begin a new cycle. Let's assume we have a piston engine and a rotor engine. Both are 1.3 liters. Piston engine has 180 degrees per stroke, but a rotor has 270 degrees per stroke. So if both engines are at similar max RPMs, it means the rotor has 1.5 times as many milliseconds to accomplish each stroke. That's why rotor breathe well because they have more time to draw in and release the mixture. Rotaries also have more time for the power stroke so it can get the most out of the combustion gas, especially at higher RPM. A 1.3 rotary delivers one and a half times the power and torque of a like-sized conventional engine. So it's like a two liter piston engine. Here's why. The rotor has three edges or flags. So one rotation of the rotor produces two times as many power pulses as a one cylinder reciprocating engine. But there are drawbacks too. The rotary also has one and a half times as many milliseconds to transfer heat from the burning mixture into the oil and water. That's why rotaries waste more heat in the process to stay cool themselves. Another disadvantage to the rotary engine is its small resource because of its engine design. A rotary, can last as little as 30,000 to 125,000 miles, or an average of 65 to 70,000 miles. A car with a rotary engine makes a good weekend car. That's because there are multiple sealing elements on the rotor to isolate the combustion chambers. The main ones with the most load are the apexes, which are installed on the rotor tops. These seals wear out extremely quickly as their working angle is constantly changing. Worn seals cause leaks between chambers. Pressure differences between them are significant, which impacts the efficiency of the engine. And since the rotor experiences temperature drops at each stroke, this leads to rapid wear. Add to this the pressure exerted on its rubbing surfaces and the crescent shape of the chambers, the high rotation speed of the rotor, and the short length of the working stroke don't contribute to full combustion. This is the reason to push out the exhaust gases that are still hot and not yet fully burned. And in addition to the combustion byproducts, the oil is also present there, which when combined makes the exhaust gas quite toxic. That's why the piston engine is much more environmentally friendly than a rotary engine. As far as oil is concerned, consumption of a rotary engine can be about 0.25 gallons per 620 miles. The gas mileage isn't ideal either. You'll only be able to drive, well, miles on a gallon. And don't forget the high cost of the engine itself, since it requires high precision equipment and very high quality materials to manufacture the engine. And it wears out faster. Considering all these reasons, we can see why the rotary engine isn't booming now. The 1973 oil crisis was the final nail in the coffin in terms of dramatic advancements of the rotary in the U.S. and Canada. Japan is the only country in the East that hasn't fully lost faith in the rotary engine. But even there, manufacturers' enthusiasm for the engine has cooled which is why there hasn't been much noteworthy developments thereafter. Mazda is the last one to hang on to it. And here's an interesting story and controversy around the Mazda RX-7. Kenichi Yamamoto was responsible for the development of rotary engines in Mazda, especially the Mazda RX-7. He led the Mazda development team the goal to make the Wankel engine more reliable. And this was back in 1961. Surprisingly, the engine saved the whole company in its day. In the early 60s, the the Japanese Ministry of International Trade and Industry, MITI, feared that the Japanese auto industry might collapse and found it necessary to limit the number of local car companies. MITI approved Toyota, Nissan, and Isuzu, but not Mazda, which
which was known as Toyo Kagyo at the time. But Mazda was able to demonstrate that their rotary engine technology has unique and viable reasons to be built for the international market. So Midi agreed, and Mazda continued working. With the resounding success of the RX-7, Yamamoto became president of Mazda. Under his leadership, most unusual models rolled off the assembly lines, with the culmination being a stunning rotary victory by a Mazda 787B sports car at the 1991 Le Mans. It was the first victory for a Japanese manufacturer, and the only such victory until Toyota won the 2018 24 Hours at Le Mans. Since 2004, the sales of the sports coupe started its decline. In 2004, some 25,000 cars were sold, but by 2010, less than 1,500 were sold. Mazda did not succeed in addressing the engine's impact to the environment or improving fuel efficiency. In 07, the project was presented at the Tokyo Motor Show. It centered around a new rotary engine with an elliptical combustion chamber, an enlarged rotor shaft, and possible direct fuel injection. But sadly, it would only remain a project, and no mass production was achieved. The latest Mazda with a rotary engine was the RX-8, but it got discontinued in 2012. So now you're probably wondering what's the future of rotary engine. Well, there hasn't been much buzz in the news in the last 10 years. You can draw your own conclusion, but I think the silence speaks for itself. Mazda confirmed that its new rotary engine will be a small unit, serving exclusively as a range extender for electric vehicles, starting in 2022, with the battery electric vehicle version of the MX-30. If you like this episode, please subscribe to my channel. Thanks for your support.